writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, the Right Pack will continue to discussing everything about agents. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host, producer, and generally crazy man, David Allen Lucas, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, president of Winding Trails Media, published in short fiction, still working on the long fiction and getting it published. With me today, and finally joining us after several weeks of absence, is the one, the only, my co- my lovely co-host herself. Hi, I'm Kathleen Kayembe. I am sorry to have been away, but it is nice to be back. Um, I actually came today with the one of my copies of The Best Science Fiction and Fantasy of the Year, Volume 12, edited by Jonathan Strahan, because my story, The Fairy Tree, is in it. Yay! Yay. Uh, Yay. So uh, you can find that story in that anthology, or you can find it uh, in Lightspeed Magazine from 2017. I believe it was November. Um, you can also find my essay on Octavia Butler, The Butler Effect, in the Hugo-nominated anthology, um, luminescent threads, connections to Octavia, and I will have other good news later, but I can't talk about it now. Ooh. And let me just Ooh, also point out that we have an episode dedicated to Octavia Butler in which Kathleen talks about how Octavia Butler has affected her and guided her mm. as far as post factory. You know, that's one of Gracie's but writers. We can mentor under somebody who's already been dead. <laughs> we, they don't. We don't ever have to meet them. Um, she also had, uh, she's, she's done a lot for, uh, writers, writers of color, um, mm-hmm. even posthumously, for instance, um, there is a scholarship that you can, that will give you a free ride to Clarion and Clarion West, um, the Octavia Butler scholarship. So people of color can apply. And if you get in, you don't have to pay the tuition for Clarion or Clarion West, whichever one takes you. And that means that people with not as much means as other people can go. And Clarion is a, mm-hmm. a, an exclusive and high-profile writing workshop. Mm-hmm. The uh, Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Workshop. Uh, it will you will you it will fast-track your career in ways you would not possibly understand before you go. Speaking as someone who has a short story and a best-of anthology right now, yeah. in large part because of Clarion. And I think Chanel should go. <laughs> Speaking of Chanel. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chanel A. Chan. I write fiction of many different varieties, but right now I'm focusing on literary and fantasy. And also with us today is the... I really need to find a female version of Leonardo da Vinci. Don't start comparing you to that person. And He's, I really should have a better recall of my fine arts training to tell you who that person is. I don't feel bad, by the way. Just, <laughs> because I never did bother with much of with art, art history. But anyway, the one, the only... Uh, I'm Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. I actually graduated with a degree in communications, not fine art. So uh, that would be why I only took one art history class and don't remember any of the names. Um, I write fantasy for young adults that you can find on Amazon. The title is Threadcaster. I also write picture books for children and adults who like picture books uh, that is available on Amazon. It's Dog Park and Dog Park 2, Cow Learns to Share, will be available this summer. So coming up, we'll have a second Dog Park book out. Sorry, did you say the title was Cow? Cow. Cow. C-A-L. Oh, Oh, thank you. Cow Learns to Share. And I'd like to just say that the Dog Park books are all based on my dogs. The first one was about cowboy making friends, which was a lie. He's he's dog aggressive. (laughs) And the second one is called Cal Learns to Share, which is a lie. He's never shared a thing in his life. (laughs) They're 
aspiration. So it's truly yeah. fiction. <laughs> it's it's definitely an a, an exercise in writing the legacy you want people to remember, not the one that actually existed. <laughs> it's funny. Cal is actually my sister's dog, and so when I told her about it, she said. It's an expose. It's a lot. It's all lies. You're writing a tabloid about my dog, and I'm like, yes, yes, it is. Yeah, I'm, I'm biting my tongue. I'm not gonna bite my tongue just because I'm going to do it anyway because I want to be a jerk. <laughs> um, so, writing the story, writing the legacy that you want people to remember versus what really happened. Oh, you're writing about politicians. Exactly. Moving Ooh. on exactly. to. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melanie Lucas. Um, I thought about writing, and I've actually, actually that's not exactly a joke, uh, I've actually given some serious thought to my characters this weekend, and tomorrow I plan to actually do some writing. So, Hooray! Yeah, yeah, of course I haven't done any actual writing. Are we going to have time tomorrow to write either one I of us? I said I was planning to, I didn't say it would actually happen. <laughs> and you need to explain, We're, we just came back from a trip to Chicago visiting a friend and doing some stuff up there. We, t- we took our laptops. We didn't have a chance to open them. Yeah. yeah. And tomorrow's going to be basically the same thing. I hate to tell her that. I know how. The, I know what tomorrow's filled with. <laughs> but we are writing. We are working on it. And also with us, coming remotely, the pirate admiral of the skies himself, of steampunk. I know I screwed that one up. I'm sorry. Go for it. Quite all right. I'll still take it. Yes, I am Brad R. Cook. I am the author of the Iron Chronicles. Uh, the Ardranium Adventures and now Tales of the Gear Blade. Uh, those are three different series. You can find them all at bradrcook.com. But also, if uh, you're a writer and you're in need of some things, I now do book covers and book layouts and other fun things like that. Find it all at bradrcook.com. You can also find it at broadswordbooks.blogspot.com. And by the way, this we're going this episode we're going to continue our talk about agents uh, we um, ended with last week. And I want to say. There are several conferences around the country, or around the world for that matter, that you as a writer, writer could go to. One is going to be in St. Louis, Missouri, June 15th through 17th. That's Father's Day weekend, called Gateway Con. It is a full-blown writer's conference with the ability to pitch to agents and publishers, a open-to-the-public free book fair, as well as a writer's retreat. For more information, visit www.stlwritersguild.org and click on Gateway Con. One last time, www.stlwritersguild.org. Click on Gateway Con. So, we're going to open up this episode today. Our Madame of Murder is not able to attend as Fedora Amos, who writes his Victorian mystery. Um, but she had something to say about agents, and I want to get everybody else's opinion on this and take on this. Niche writers and nonfiction writers might not do well to seek niche publishers. Do it. You, not, they might, might, they might, might do well. Might do well. I'm sorry. Did I, I say not do well. Yeah. I apologize. Let me retrace that. It changes that. the entire context. Uh, <laughs> taking two on that. Thank you. I entered my own stuff there. Okay. Niche writers and nonfiction writers might do well to seek niche publishers. Your pitch will fall on more receptive ears, both to publisher and the specialized audience the publisher has already amassed for you. Agents who are looking, agents are looking for the next Stephen King or Suzanne Collins, folks who write books with expansive audience potential. Trying to interest literary agents in a specific genre offerings would probably fill your desk with rejection letters. Also consider your reaction to stress. Agents only get paid when they sell. They can only sell material that authors write. They can and do pressure writers to create more and faster output. What are some of your thoughts on that? Brad, jumping right on in. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so uh, Fedora and I often disagree uh, on uh, Right Pack Radio, and this time we are definitely going to disagree. Um, because as much as I think that, yes, you can navigate this industry without an agent, and there are many, 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 many roads to walk down. Uh, so many, in fact, and most of them do not require an agent. However, uh, as I said the previous hour, 
uh, the brass ring, the big giant sales contracts and the, the movie deals and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm not talking about where Hollywood options your book. I'm talking about the, the George R. R. Martin, J.K. Rowling, you get to sit in the chair while, you know, Hollywood bigwigs are around you making your, you know, book into a movie. That's still pretty exclusively the realm of the agented uh, author slash big publishing deal. Uh, so to that end, I would disagree. However, uh, I will also agree with her in the sense that there are a lot of places to go if you are not agented or unagented or not looking for an agent or don't care about an agent um, that you can still do and you're still going to have a career and you're still going to make money and you're still going to have a life. Uh, so do not fear if you are rejected. Okay, go to Melanie, then to Jen. Well, there were two separate things, and I don't know if they should be talked about, again, separately or together. But first off, she was saying that if you were a genre author, you might get a lot of rejections. Um, this, well, in last week's episode, we talked a whole lot about um, doing your research. You need to find an agent and only apply to agents that cover what you're writing. So if you've written a mystery, you should submit to agents that are looking for mysteries. If you're, let's say, writing a Regency romance, guess what? Agents, agents represent Regency romances. And uh, if it's what they're looking for, they'll pick it up. If it's what they happen to be looking for. Mm -hmm. The well, second thing she says is that agents only get paid if they sell, which is absolutely true. Mm -hmm. And then they pressure you to write. Well. As maybe I said last week, you shouldn't try and sell your book to an agent, uh, to search for an agent, until you're already finished writing. <laughs> Let me dovetail in and I'm going to come yeah. here to Jen. Here's the thing with agents on the good and the bad, as far as what you're saying, Melanie. Mm -hmm. One, if you should not be trying to pitch your book until it's done. And yes, there are exceptions to every rule. I can think of somebody who broke that rule. Um, <laughs> not to mention any names, Angie Fox. Um, she did it successfully. Way to throw her under the bus. <laughs> she throws herself under the bus with it. Yes. So I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking out of school on that. Um, and she did a fantastic job with doing it. But it's the books that follow. That, that's where the agent pressure is coming in. And I'm going to be honest, um, if you've listened to Right Pack Radio for any length of time, you know I've been struggling the last several years to reignite my writing. And one of the things is, I, I won't guarantee I would have had an agent. I had the opportunity for an agent, and that's as far as I'm going to take it to say that, before I had to put my writing career on hiatus. I would have been in some contractual issues had I actually gone forward and actually been able to land that agent and so forth. There would have been some massive pressure, so sometimes not having that pressure does help. Over to you, Jen, and then I've got Brad, then I've got Kathleen and Chanel. Well, I'll answer both halves of Go for her. It. Since we're talking about the pressure that your agent puts on you, if you are seeking, if you are seeking a writing career that in, involves having an agent, mm -hmm. uh, most people have an agent and a job. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, most people who write anything have writing and another job. Whether it's another job like technical manual writing, uh, that is what the big money for your phone bill comes from. <laughs> and then there's the other writing that is a very slow growing career. And for most people, it does not reach the point of Suzanne Collins or Stephen King. Right. Where they are looking, where most of their money comes from their fiction. All of their money comes from their fiction. Uh, so agents are very aware of this, mm -hmm. but they do want you to keep producing. Right. So the, the question of uh, how you deal with stress, it's more... Uh, you're inviting another person in to keep you on track, mm -hmm. but they're they're not gonna. If you if you pick the right agent, they'll work with your schedule to know right. what you're looking for, and they might be the ones to tell you to what I call Da Vinci it, which is all art is not finished; it's abandoned. No. It's like give me something. 
so that I can start working on it. And maybe that's what you need. If you're not really writing a lot on your own time and you don't see that changing or you don't want that to change, then maybe a career in writing, which involves getting an agent and a publisher and, and publishing books steadily, is not really what you want. And then you look into something a little bit more low-key, something a little bit more hobby-ish, let's say. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do the other part of hers, if you don't mind. I know I'm talking a lot. Um, no, you're not. You're fine. Uh, she mentioned, like uh, Melanie reiterated, niche publishing, like if you're looking for a very specific corner of the world to publish in, maybe it's best to go to the publishers that facilitate that. But she added nonfiction in there, too. I think it's important to bring up that nonfiction has a very different process. Yes, it does. Uh, you don't write... A, like, when you're writing a fiction story, you write the entire story, and then you query it. When you're writing a nonfiction, you write a proposal, and then you sell the proposal, and then you write the book. So, having an agent for nonfiction could be useful... Uh, but you're looking for a specific agent in nonfiction that knows how to help you craft a proposal that will work that in. I sense that Brad wants to wants to segue into that. <laughs> uh, yeah, jumping in real quick, I, I just want to clarify something that Jen just brought up. Uh, de depending upon what type of nonfiction you are writing, yes. a, uh, a, an agent may be required. Much in the same sense that an agent is required to get into the big five. Uh, if you are writing, uh, you know, <sighs> if you're writing like something that's going to be a huge book and I don't necessarily mean selling in every Barnes and Noble, that's a whole other story, but I mean like, you know, this is going to become a textbook or something like that. And your job is to get it into the universities and all of that kind of stuff. That is a much, much harder road for a self-published author than an agented author. Uh, and it's for all the same reasons about gatekeepers and who does what and you know who gets where all that kind of stuff so nonfiction I, I actually would recommend that if you're going to be writing nonfiction and it's not just like a biography on somebody or something smaller you know like I'm writing the history of St. Louis Writers Guild nobody's going to publish that uh, I don't need an agent for that however if I was writing the history of railroads I might actually consider getting an agent for that because that book has the potential to become a real huge thing so that's all. Or if you're writing a book, I'm going to go over to Kathleen, who's patiently waiting on Dovetail, but to go off of what Brad just said, and I've got Dovetail for Kathleen. If you're writing a textbook about how to do um, emergency medicine, no, no credible university, at least in the United States, is going to touch your self-published book on that. Because you're you going, need a platform. Right. That's well, what the proposal's for, is to prove that you got the chops. Yeah, that you got the chops. It's all about your author platform in right. fiction. So with that, I'm going to jump over to Kathleen. Let's her dovetail and then go for it. So um, I, I've mentioned this on the show before, but I have ADD. Like, I would live my best life if I had a personal assistant who would mm -hmm. make me do the things that I get distracted from doing all day. Mm -hmm. So, like, I would be more productive if I had someone who was like, what about this? I, I want to hear, I want to see this story. Like, when is it going to be ready? Mm -hmm. Like, I want you to write more of this. And I have a friend who I immediately clicked with and then found out she also has ADD. And she, um, her, her, how she landed an agent, like, she landed an agent after having a book deal. Like, hmm. she's, her, her story is crazy and I'm not getting into it. But, um. She has a good relationship with her agent, and her agent um, is kind of that person for her. Like, she has written multiple novels. I have not finished one yet. Mm -hmm. But, like, in the same three- or four-year period, um, her agent has, like, had her continue thinking about writing and, like, um, just getting her kind of like her own kind of cheerleading squad. That's yeah. kind of one of the functions of her agent. And it sounds fabulous to me. And I was afraid of the whole agent experience where, you know, they, they continually will expect work from you. It felt like another, another job, something that would make writing harder. But seeing her experience with her agent, I'm like, oh, actually, this, is, this would be super helpful. So, I mean, on the one hand, Fedora is talking about the expectations, and that's not necessarily great for everyone. 
But when you get an agent, when you choose an agent, you're choosing someone who will have a good relationship with you, whose way of getting you to write more is going to fit with what makes you write more, but from a place of joy and productivity. Yeah, there's a big difference well, between encouragement and pressure punishment. Yes. And when you yeah. choose an agent, ideally you're going to want to choose the one that <laughs> encourages rather than pressure punishes. That's a recipe for finding a new agent. Right. Which and is a bad marriage. <laughs> and it will end in divorce. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm going to dovetail in real quick to Kathleen. And I think, Brad, are you a dovetail or are you a oh, board? Okay. Then I'll go over to Chanel, then to Brad. Um, two things really fast and Kathleen you've really touched on something huge but before I go down to what you touched on um, if go back to the last episode where we talked about agents part one and you heard me say that the relationship with you and your agent is a business partnership it is it, which makes them yes like a good business partner they'll be your cheerleader or they should be your cheerleader they do have obligations, and you, when you have a business partner, you've got obligations to fulfill. That's life. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of people out there who believe that they never should have an agent. Okay. That, that, that's your preference. And guess what? We live now in a time period of publishing, but you don't have to have an agent. As Brad said earlier, there's lots of different roads you can walk down. But I'm going to throw this out. While the agent has a contractual relationship with you and the publishing house as well, and there's certain obligations you have to fulfill, and yes, there's a lot of pressure there, remember too, if you went down the road of indie publishing, you have a lot of pressures, additional pressures that are on yourself that, are, that the agent helps take care of in their administration. Just putting that out there, thinking about it, just something to add. Chanel? So I'm not sure, because um, I haven't um, been here, uh, what was discussed with regard to um, just the idea of fitting with an agent. Mm -hmm. Like, it seems to me like there seems to be a lot, like, a lot of semi-understood, uh, um, a lot of semi-expressed understandings that need to be aired out and or a lot of puzzle pieces that need to fit together for this whole magical union to happen. What happens if that doesn't happen? Like what happens if the puzzle pieces don't click together? If the if they're fighting, if like if the talking heads aren't <laughs> aligned with the cosmos, what happens if your agent fit is not a good agent fit for you? I'm gonna go Brad, then Kathleen. Brad uh, well, the first thing I would throw out is you leave that agent, um, which sounds scary to people who don't have an agent, but it actually happens a lot where an agent and author will, you know, they picked up each other, they've come to, a, you know, they work together and then they come to an understanding eventually and are like, uh, this isn't working out the way we had hoped. And you move on and you get another agent. I will say it is easier to land a second agent than a first agent. So that is a kind of an important little thing to caveat there. Uh, but yeah, it, it is important. And I would say that all of this should get hopefully ironed out or at least uh, addressed in the call, which is the, the, the call is the famous call. When an agent decides to pick you up, they will not just send you an email saying, congrats, you've made it. They, they send you an email saying, uh, can we have a phone call, you know, tomorrow, today, whatever. And you arrange that phone call, and then you have the chance to ask a lot of questions of the agent, and that would be a time to try and figure out, uh, is this person and I going to work well together? So Meeting for... them is also another really great way. So what I like to do is I'm going to put a pin in what Brad just said, because Brad, let's go down that road in a little bit about the steps with the agent that you're going to go through. That was a great intro to it, but I've got Kathleen with a dovetail. I'm going to go with her first. Oh, see. And then I believe... Melanie has something to add. I was just going to say you get divorced. Yeah. And yeah. just like with divorce, they still were your agent for that particular deal. So you will still have to deal with them when that particular book shows up on your radar. Assuming yeah. that they uh, then sold one for you. Yeah. Being divorced yeah. If, with if kids. there is a child involved. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. yeah, my assumption is that there was a child involved. So basically <laughs> with an agent, like it's like a marriage in some ways. And the books that they sell for you are your children. So even if you get divorced later, you still have these children together. And if 
something is going on with the children, you both have to deal with it. But Go ahead. to further this analogy, um, it's uh, hopefully it's an amicable divorce Ideally. because everyone understands that this is business. <laughs> right. The you know don't not get an agent for fear that you're going to have to break up with an agent and then have to deal with them. Yeah. Like that's. I've only heard of one epic meltdown. <laughs> In Most all of my like years dealing with agents and stuff like that, I've only heard of one epic meltdown between an agent and an author. Usually, it's a it's a sweet little business arrangement of this isn't working. Okay, let's move on. I have I have a if you're done. Yeah, I'm, I, okay. I, am. Mm-hmm. I have a question after Melanie with going tying exactly into the what into conversations. Go ahead, Melanie. Then I'm... okay, you said that you know how do we figure out at the beginning? Let's talk about prenuptial agreements now. <laughs> yes. So uh, you ask about the agent phone call when an agent wants to represent your book. You're gonna have a phone call. You say you should ask them some questions. Do you have any suggestions on either questions okay. to definitely ask or resources to provide pause, you the questions? Pause, 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 pause. I want to come back to this. Okay. I, w- I really do. I want to go yeah. through that. In fact, that's going to be, Brad, if you don't mind, this going to be our next section after this question. The question I have for you, I know how this works with a publisher. The question is how did, does this work with an agent that you end up getting needing to break ties with? Or to borrow the term earlier, divorce. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have got a series I've written or in the middle of writing. I'm now on book three of, say, five books. And I need to fire my agent. Now, if I was writing it and I'm talking about a publisher, you're looking at a fight to get back your rights to your other three books that you've got published. How does that play with the agent? Uh, Jen, you got Well, you're... You're under contract, mm-hmm. and when you break a contract, that is leading to somewhat of a new contract. You're arriving at an agreement, right? And I'm gonna not say this with any sort of authority because obviously I am not an agent, and I don't. I have not broken up with an agent having successfully published a series of books, but you publish your series, and that series is gonna come with a "if you leave this agent, this is what happens" clause, and Often it's, we have the rights to this property, Mm -hmm. to publishing these books for the next five years or so, and then it's just a waiting game to get it back, or you can fight them in court, but you're agreeing that you're going to publish with them this thing, and they're going to continue reprinting those books that they then are under contract with you for, for as long as they need to, and then your rights will refer, you know, revert to you. Upon which time the contract says that they will. Okay, and Brad. Brad's no, Brad's saying no. no. Yeah, that that's not the way it works. Um, okay, good. The way that it works for you, you have a deal with your agent. So you sign a contract with your agent. That is not your book deal in any way, shape, or form. Your book deal is with the publisher. Your book deal will expressly provide the the book all the details for the book. Once that deal is struck, that deal is done. Very rarely are you ever going to go back and renegotiate that contract. So, if Agent A has my, you know, negotiated my series with the publisher, then Agent A will receive 15% of my makings of that book forever. If I move to public, if I move to Agent B, Agent B may occasionally step in to deal if there's some new headache that pops up. Um, but more than likely that deal is, is over here and agent B is going to strike new deals and new books and new things over here. And agent A will retain the money that they make from there. It is, it is entirely on the author side, not on the book side, if that makes sense. So breaking up with an agent is not a problem. It happens all the time and it does not affect your book deal at all. Uh, the book deal is struck by the agent, and then if you have a new agent, they're going to strike new book deals. So uh, the only thing that you might run into is if you had the first book, and then you moved out and no longer are, say, your agent gives up agenting or moves houses, and that wouldn't even be a move house, it gives up agent, uh, and you have to go get another agent. That second agent may then strike the deal for the three book series. 
Okay. Uh, and then it's a workaround for if there's a, an agency that needs to get paid, they'll work all that stuff out amongst themselves. That is not something you will ever have to actually get involved in. So uh, an agent is in a relationship with the author. A publisher is a relationship with the book, if that makes the most sense there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Jen, you had your hand. Go no, I'm just, go okay. that's, that's a, a nice, tidy answer. We'll let it sit there. Perfect. <laughs> it is. So let, but let's... to get more complicated is getting into contract work and all kinds of weird stuff like that. And most of our listeners don't need to hear. But the important thing is just that an agent represents the author and the book is with the publisher. So Cool. Okay, so let's go ahead. I, I've told us we're, we're put, we put a pin in something. I'm now taking the pin out. Let's, let's break down the steps. Oh my gosh, it's going. Huh? It uh, exploded. He's yeah, taking okay. the pin out. It's going to explode. Oh, see, so I was thinking of it as a pegboard. Yeah. So okay. it was a much less dramatic taking of the pin. It just means it's released that paper to the ground. <laughs> and right now, I really feel like I should be inject, um, sucking down some helium and then talking that. Yeah. But anyway, no helium to suck. Um, <laughs> That's hell. Anyway, so here, here's the thing. But I couldn't. I am now a writer, be it a hybrid or wanting to be a hybrid, or a tradition, or I want to go down just a traditional road. For those who don't know, a hybrid is somebody who is self-published as well as gone down the road of traditional published. So I am now approaching an agent. I am approaching them either at a writer's conference or I am sending a query letter. I can go down both these roads here as far as our discussion. So what, what's my first step? And then let's go all the way through. You get accepted. This is where we're going with this. You get accepted, blah, 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 blah. And your contract eventually gets signed. So that just for your information, that's where we're headed down. So first off, last episode, we talked about query letters and we talked about pitches. So I don't, I'm not going to rehash that part but you will do a query letter or you will do a pitch to the agent now what happens let's say the agent likes you or like likes the proposal kathleen well i have not gone looking for agents i'm not at that stage right now but my impression was that the first step was always have a thing that is finished and ready to go out right if you're um, if you're writing fiction if you're writing non-fiction that's a different ball game I yeah think. it's a different it, it can you can be both um, but like as far as fiction writing is concerned, I have a thing that is ready to send out. Right. Um, generally, I, I, I hear generally it's a novel. Like I'm not sure that you do the same thing with short stories. No, short stories are different. Yeah. This is for, for novel length work. Yeah. So have a novel length work that is ready to go out. Because if you go and you pitch and it's not ready, then there's all that time between their excitement for your project and it actually getting to them. And let me point, point out something here. And... If anybody knows differently, please correct me. But the last conversation I had with some agents about this, this is the case, usually agents don't represent short fiction. In years past, decades past, that was a case that's not anything modern. So anyway, okay, so after what Kathleen said, so you, you've got your work pump, you got your work done. Jen. Um, you... you look online to some fantastic resources on places like writersdigest.com to learn how to craft a stunning query letter mm -hmm. or how to deliver a fantastic in-person pitch and go to somewhere like GatewayCon where possible agents are sitting and taking pitches from you. Right. And there is a science to all these things. So just winging it is a little dangerous. Please do your research before you show up. They will thank you for it. And then they will have a favorable opinion of you afterwards because they know that you were right on the ball. Uh, you submit. And I want to take a moment now to say that you'll probably get rejected a whole bunch. And right. that's okay. We've been referring to this as a marriage. In this case specifically, it's very much like a marriage. You go on a lot of first dates. Sometimes they ask you on a second date, which is when they ask for materials from you. They read your, your query or they hear your pitch and they say, send me this many pages of your work to see how you write. And uh, it, they might ask for a partial, they may ask for a full, they may ask for a partial and then a full in a second time. And even then they may uh, say, no, thank you, this is not for me. And that has nothing to do with you as a writer. It has everything to do with what they are looking for specifically and whether they click and want to marry you. 
partial, full, what? Of your of your entire finished manuscript. A full, I hope, is self-explanatory. It's the whole thing. A partial would be a part. Usually, you know, send me the, the first 50 pages or send me the first three chapters or send me the first whatever they want. Almost every agency and agent has a different preference. Right. Oh, so they just want a Word document attached to your email, Absolutely huh? not. <laughs> wait. Well, no, well, hold up. No, wait, exactly at that point they, they do. At that oh. point they do. What is yeah, it? you're talking about a request, not not a query. We yes. are into the request market. I'm sorry. If it's a request, then it is an attachment to your email in a Word doc or uh, something along those lines. So something they can read on sorry. their phone on the subway. I got confused. I'm sorry. Wait, you just said preferences. Are you telling me that different agents have different preferences? Oh How do you God. find these out? How? You look Brad, them up. Look them up. Where? Well, we mentioned uh, Query Tracker last episode. Uh, and all those other uh, websites you mentioned to look up and see what their what different agents uh, are requesting. Those are good places to go. Also, their personal websites. Mm -hmm. They list what they need, especially if they're in an agency. They have submission guidelines you need to follow. Going to that really quick, and then it looks like Brad will be next. You've got Query Tracker out there. You've got Writer's Market, which ha which is part of Writer's Digest. Other places to look besides Googling your preferred um, agent directly is, don't forget, Writer's Digest, as Jen has said, Writer's Magazine, which is another magazine aimed at writers, kind of like Writer's Digest, as well as Poet, Poet and Writers. They all have information on agents. It's usually a rotating section to the, to, section to the magazine. Brad, over to you. Yeah, I would also turn out that uh, you have Google, where you can search out every agency's submission guidelines and right. what they're looking for. And then also I would throw out that uh, there are resources you can go to like Twitter and other places where the agents themselves are telling you what they're looking for and all that kind of fun stuff. It's on Tumblr, it's on Twitter, uh, it's probably even on Facebook. I'm just not as connected to authors or agents and stuff on Facebook. Um, what I was going to throw out, so what we're talking about here, and to start off with you, we were uh, throwing out earlier, David, about mm -hmm. where to begin this process at. We just talked about the brass ring of pitching, which is uh, the request, and that is huge. If you get a request, you pop the champagne bottle because that is a win. I don't care if it's a partial request, a full request, or whatever. An agent is going to directly look at your work, and that is awesome. So what happens? They read your work. And they're going to get back to you, hopefully. Uh, I will throw out that the uh, no call or the no response rejection is a thing now. And, you know, it, it happens. So if you don't hear from them in a few weeks and you nudge them and you don't hear from them after a few weeks after that, uh, that's no. Uh, you might get a letter back that says, uh, you know, parts of this were great, but no. You might get uh, something else that uh, says just a little stock answer of this isn't for me, but keep going because it's really good. Those are all rejections. Those are all wonderful things to get. But what you're really hoping, though, is what I mentioned earlier, which is the call. Mm -hmm. The call is when the agent has decided they like you. Now, at this point, a lot of things have actually happened behind the scenes that you don't know about. Uh, the agent has decided they like you. The agent has turned other agents in their place. Usually it'll start off with the interns or something like that who might actually be the first person to say they like you. Then the agent was the second person to say they like you. The agent goes to what's known as the editorial meeting. It could be known as just a, a, a conference meeting amongst all the agents, and they talk about the books that they well, have received. Let me, let me pause you, Brad, for a second. And that they're looking at. Brad, let me pause you briefly there. I, want you to do, I do want you to continue from there. When he's talking about an agent's con in the conference room, the agent conference, that he's talking about all the agents at a particular agency talking to each and other. one agency, yes. Right, not all the agents <laughs> in the <laughs> world no. talking. Oh, I, 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 I realize... They're all together in one room. Not not all the in that room. Yeah. It just, and no one would leave until I have a contract. <laughs> I, I do want to clarify that. Um, before we go any further, Brad, I do want to say real quick, this is to the, those who really are determined to be indie published, even if you are never going to pitch your work to an agent, your pitch is highly important. Why? Guess who? Guess what? How? How you're selling this book 
to somebody who's going to buy it. You're doing a pitch. Yeah. So with I mean, that, the same pitch you're using to, to to get an Asian hooked is the same pitch you're going to use to get a reader hooked. It, at least similar, I should say. It's yep. the exact same, but it'll be similar. <laughs> it's got a lot of the same ingredients. But so, at that meeting, right, the in the agency, uh, they've all sat around and talked about all the cool books that they've found at conferences and everywhere else like that. And your book gets brought up. And if a bunch of people went, hmm, that's a really good book. I think that'd be a good idea. Then you get the call, which is where the agent says. Uh, hey, I'd like to talk to you on the phone. And you're going to set up a time and you're going to have a conversation and they're going to call you up and they're going to have a bunch of questions for you like, so what else have you written? Or uh, where do you see this book going? Or how do you intend to market this book? Or They're going to have a ton of questions for you, stuff like that. They're also going to have a ton of questions of just normal stuff like, hey, do you have cats or dogs? Because um, this is, a, as we've been talking about, a personal relationship. And then from that call... You're going to sign a contract, probably. Uh, a contract with the agent. And that's going to stipulate a whole bunch of things about what the agent's going to do for you and a few things about what you might have to do in terms for of your them. career. But mostly it's about what the agent's going to do for you. And then your book's going to go into, hopefully, some kind of back and forth with the agent where it might be rounds of editing. It might just be, hey, I think you need to punch this character up or... It could be a numerous things, but then what the agent's really going to do is send your book out on submission where they start firing off to every editor they know who's looking for your type of book and they're going to get it in their hands and hopefully you will get a publishing deal out of that. Um, so that's really kind of what an agent does. Those are the kind of the first few steps that you're going to run into. Whether or not they do any actual editing back and forth really determines how good your book is, how finished it is, and how much like work an agent does. Some do are really hands-on with books. Some are really hands-off with books. So, so these are all things to kind of figure out in that call, in that conversation. And they expect you to have questions. So there are – Google them. There are a ton of questions you can ask. Uh, of, you know, There's blogs about the questions you should ask. Um, but know that you should have some in your mind about what you want to talk about, um, where you want your career to go, what can they do for you, uh, what can you do to help you know them. If you know an a editor or if you uh, are headed to a conference or anything like that, these would be the times to discuss this kind of stuff. Um, and then just you know, in general about your career going forward, where you think it should go, where they think it should go, that kind of fun stuff. Chanel. Um. So I have a, a question. Um, I've heard you guys discuss this before, and I'm not sure if this falls into the pitch side of things or onto the call side of things. I don't know. Talking to agents just makes me really squeaky because, oh, God. But I um, know you're really good at it. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, she really don't make, is. Don't make me offer proof. I will do it on the air. <laughs> what? Don't make me give proof. I will do it on the air. Bet. Receipts. Okay, anyway, what's your question? So, um... I've heard that like you need to have sort of like an analogous um, compa a comparison to something that's currently out there. Like, okay, this is Lara Croft meets the Jonas Brothers in a vampire extraordinary extraordinaire. Like, I need to know, like, is that something that you would say during your pitch? I hope that's not actually a thing. Um, <laughs> actually, oh, that should be a thing. Very much a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Also, one of those yeah. needed to be a book that was published in, in the last five basically, years. Basically, is what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, is that something that, like, um, uh, is that something that you would say, tell, talk, is that something that would come up in the call? Like, uh, like you, that should have come up before the call. That should come yeah. up, like, come up in the pitch. pitch. This okay. should be in the pitch. A comp title should be in the pitch. And what it is, it's comparing two books that have come out in the last three years to uh, your book. And it's not about comparing the exact books. It's about saying that the tone of this novel is like the tone of my novel. The themes of this novel are similar to the themes of my novels. The, the readership of this novel is similar to the readership of my novel and why. And the reason this is so important is a thing, and I go into this in my workshop, uh, my pitching workshop. Uh, this is how Hollywood, and more importantly, the publishing industry talks about books. Um, it's a quick, fast, easy thing. People really grasp to it. So if your book is, you know, uh, 
Sinter meets the goldfinch, then what you're really saying is my book is a YA that is sort of fairy taleish in a new way with a new with a new twist there, but then it's very literary and it's very much about the character Cinder or you know whatever you know what you'd be comparing those two kinds of books together. So that's what a comp title is supposed to accomplish: is saying my book is this in basically as few words as possible by saying it's this meets this. Okay, and also therefore proving that you read books. That too. Right. You know the current state of the industry, which is why you should pick books uh, no later than three years old. You should never be like, it's the Bible meets Lord of the Rings. This is where I fail in all my pitches because I don't have time to read books. Um, Audio books, though. Yes. I just, I just yes. want to give a plug for audiobooks for those of you who, like Jen, are like, I don't have time to read. I didn't read a whole lot, but then Chanel over here got me hooked on audiobooks, and... Depending on your library system, they will have audiobooks you can put on your phone and listen to wherever. Mm -hmm. I have read so many books already this year, and so for those needing to read titles that are current, check out your library, check out Audible. There are options, generally, like especially for those with, with commutes. I have read so much while driving. Mm -hmm. It's great. Yes, and another good reason uh, for authors also to focus on Audible and getting an audiobook out there, same reason. But I would throw out Jen. Uh, I, too, am bad at the comp title thing. And what you really do is you know your genre, you go to Goodreads, <laughs> you go to Amazon, and you find your genre, and you find the top books in your genre, and then you go, this book's similar to mine, and that one's kind of similar to mine, and you put those two together, and more than likely, you're going to sound like you knew what you were talking about. Ah, fake it till you make it. Yep. Let me just, I, I know Kathleen went on a sidebar there with audio, of audiobooks. Let me just read give you something just FYI this is coming from the voice acting side of me and by the way this is dated the second I say it so next year this industry part could change currently audiobooks are on audible are not likely to show up in the library in that way there's two separate systems so just FYI on that if you if you want to have your book done into an audio book that may show up in a library, you need to go traditional published. Mm. Uh, just point blank, and that's the way they work, and yeah, go ahead. I'm glad that you said this is dated as soon as I say it, mm -hmm. because I, I just got a thing from uh, the library talking about how to get your own books into the library, mm -hmm. the St. Louis County Library System. Yeah. So it may be that, you know, as time progresses, this, yep. this will change and you may be able to have books that are not traditionally published, audiobooks available in your libraries. And it may now, require you to do something to get it in there. Basically have there it on a platform option. that's not audible. Aud audible, for example. That right. might be one of the things that might be necessary. And that's one thing, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop it because we are off on a different tangent. We are. Those in St. Louis, which, by the way, if you're outside of St. Louis, we are a weird city and county. The <laughs> city is its own county. Then you've got the county of St. Louis. And between the two of those, there's actually three library systems. Yep. That it, it, the St. Louis County Library is reaching out more to ind independent writers. So yeah, if you want to know that. about Audible books or audio books and uh, pitching to agents, come to Gateway County because we'll be talking about both there. Right. And we also do have previous episodes both on pitching as well as audio books in which George and I talk about voice acting. Go ahead. Okay, so getting us back to the talk of agents. Thank you. Um, <laughs> that's, why, that's why I summarized that last part. Yeah. Okay, so getting us back to the talk of agents. So um, at this point, we are, um, the call has happened. You are making sure that like they're a decent person. They're making sure you're a decent person. You're making sure that you can work together to get your book baby out there. Mm -hmm. um, so then after that, it gets hashed back and forth from editors to whatever, whatever, please take me through the next steps because I don't know. Well, the next step, um, the agent will will take your manuscript and then they'll do the, exactly what you did to try and get them only to editors and publishers. Right. As they go around and they try and sell your book to these different houses, these different editors and publishers in the big five and other places with the, the log line, with... 
I read this and it reminds me of this other thing. And I think you'd really like this because you liked this other part, which is why you need the agent is because they know all of these editors and they have inroads into these publishing houses and they know how to sell to those things and they carry with them a certain amount of, I know what your industry is, this is good for you. If I showed up, me, Jennifer Stolzer, showed up at Scholastic and said, I have a book that I know what you want, they're like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> and how on earth would you know what I want? <laughs> you didn't have lunch with me yesterday. Yeah. I don't know. You don't know me at all. <laughs> it was like, where, where's your memo on my desk? So the, the agent will then try and sell your book to one of these places, and these places will go through the same vetting system internally in their side mm. to say, is this book good for our catalog for next year or the year after? And then they'll come back and they'll give an acceptance and a contract to the agent who then will discuss it with you, who then everyone signs it, and et cetera. Um, Brad, do you want to add to that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I want to add to that. The, the process that she's talking about there, Jen hit it right on the money when she says it's just like pitching. It is literally your next round of pitching. It is the exact same. The agent's going to craft a query letter that is your pitch of the book, and she or, she or he is going to work with you on that pitch and crafting that pitch. Uh, they might even have, like, you know, you're going to send submissions in and all. It, it's just like uh, querying or pitching for, you know, it's just now the agent's doing it to publishers and editors uh, than you are, you know, to get into the house. Janela, so did you take down your dub? Did you take down I your have dub? the dub but are you going straight to Brad? Yeah. Okay, okay go, go for it, Jen. Uh, say that it, and it also comes with just the same amount of rejection opportunity. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. And there is a very, there, there's a, tr an op there is a chance that your book will not get picked up, even though it got you an agent. Right. Okay, so that was JK what I was Rowling. No, 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 J.K. Rowling went through how many? Like, 11. 30 or 40 publishers mm -hmm. getting rejected by them all. And that was her and her agent, you know, sending it out, getting rejected, and going, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to go to the next one. Sending it out, getting rejected until, you know, they decided to do something different. But, yeah. So that Just was... as much rejection. <laughs> so that was going to be my question, actually. What happens if the agent doesn't get, like, um, they don't get a pull on their queries? Like, is that, like, what happens if, you know, two years go by, three years go by, still no bites? 800 rejections later. Yeah, like okay, it, it may not be three years. <laughs> so dead books are a thing. Um, basically, you you can totally have this happen where you get the agent off that book, and it's a great book, and the agent sends that book out. Uh, and usually, the most of the times I've heard about this happening, a book very similar to yours just got published. Um, at which point, you are, no one wants to touch your book because Holly or uh, the publishing industry is not as bad as Hollywood in that they don't publish two books, you know, that are the exact same, just six months apart or less. Mm -hmm. Looking at you, Armageddon. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the point being is that uh, this will happen where your book will go out on submission and no one will pick it up and the book is essentially dead. And uh, disreputable agents uh, will have in their contract, at that point, you're dropped. Most agents, though, and 90% of them, will ask you to write something else and, you know, help you kind of not ask you to write something else you should have something else in the queue that you're working right. on and they'll help you push that book out and work with you for your next book and get it going this can be a process i know authors who had successful series and then that series ended and the next series didn't do very well and so they kind of take a hiatus and then they write something new and they kind of work back and forth and eventually you know several years down the line they come out again uh, so this is, it can happen, it, it, it just, you know, if your book doesn't make it, there's generally reasons for it, but uh, it is it is not the typical norm, I would say. Uh, we publish so many books this year, like nowadays, that uh, there's somewhere for your book to go, generally. So what would, like, the t I know you said it wouldn't be like two years or three years or whatever, what would the timeline usually be before they're like, ah, oh, this isn't working? It could easily be a year or more. I mean, you have to think about it. So they're going to send it on a round of submissions. It's just like querying. So you're going to send out a batch to these five editors that you think want it right then. If those five editors come back and say, no, we're not interested, then you're going to go, oh, okay, well, I know these five editors. And you send it to them. And if they come back and they're saying no, and you're going to go, well, okay, I guess 
you know, the big five aren't really interested in it. So we're going to go to the mid-level, you know, guys and see, you know, uh, and then you go. And some of those mid-level actually make more money because for you, the author, because their deals are better and they're more hyper-focused on you. Uh, but point being, they'll send them out to there. Uh, if those don't make it, you have all your small presses. If those don't make it, you've got tons of other things you can do. And some agencies now are what are known as like a hybrid agency, where if it really goes through the whole gambit and you run and nobody wants it or anything, they'll help you self-publish it uh, and get it out that way too. That's a whole new side of the industry. I wouldn't want to touch too much on it because I don't know very much about it. Um, so, but it is, it's a thing that is popping up more and more. And as you said, Brad, this is a brand new section to the industry. But a couple of years ago, heck, as far as I know, even last year it might not have existed. That's why Right Back Radio exists. We are exploring this constantly changing world. And I do mean exploring. Okay. Um, with that, is there any other statements or questions? Because I'm well, going to bring us to a close. And did we cover the entire list? Brad? Well... Go first. Somebody else has something to go for. I believe Kathleen, then I think I heard. Oh, I was going to go back to Fedora's comment about uh, niche writers and niche publishers. Yes. Um, and uh, how your pitch will fall on more receptive ears both to the publisher and specialized audience the publisher has already amassed for you if it's a niche publisher. And I was just going to say, you know, small presses and uh, publishers that are, go for a very specific kind of thing are wonderful and are nothing to be afraid of or ashamed of. Like, when I when I first started um, publishing, when I published my novella in 2011, um, it was with a small press. And I knew it was a kind of story that a big publisher would never take because it was a gay romance. Like, people were still, like, I, I still hear stories about people who are asked to change one of their queer protagonists into a different gender so that it's a male-female couple mm -hmm. by publishers. And when I started writing Jinx, like, ten years ago, I knew it was never something that I could get published. I would probably have to self-publish it because even small presses at the time were not going to publish, you know, a, a lesbian romance story that was not primarily romance it was primarily um a paranormal investigation mm -hmm. like it is it is change enough that i think now like that there are publishers that i know i can send that to like like i've said before less than three press i love them and they're the ones that published me before but their market is um queer relationship stories like mm -hmm. that is what they publish and there is a built-in audience for that that they have already tapped into like i don't know about the big five as far as that being the sort of thing that they would do. Um, so for niche markets, like those could be perfect for you, have a built-in audience for you. And there's nothing wrong with going with a small press if your audience is already built in and they love what, you pub what you're what you trying to publish. I mean, there's, it can be great to have a bigger publisher, but if they don't love what you do and have an audience for what you do, then your book is going to sync with them. And that's not going to be your fault, but it is going to affect your career. Correct. Okay. Brad, over to you. And actually, why don't you take us to the ending? Cool. Yeah, I, have, I was going to finish this off with the last thing that I think is really important that agents do for uh, authors. Um, and it has to do with your career after your own book. Um, so one of the beauty things that you can do if uh, you are gifted enough to move into a successful career in this world is uh, write for other known franchises. Uh, if you want to write Star Wars books, if you want to write Star Trek books, if you want to write, you know, for a known franchise or something like that, if you uh, want to take on the, uh, you know, some of the big properties, um, and I'm not talking about writing for Marvel or anything. These are these are movie adapted books and things of that nature. Uh, However, there's, there's a whole series of like aftermarkets that you can get into. As a young adult author and a middle grade author, uh, you know those like little tiny books, but there's like 40 in the series and it's like all about something, like some topic or about planes or cars or sports or whatever. Most of those books are, and the Star Wars books and all of those kinds of things, these are all written by authors. Um, the only way to get these deals is to have had an agent, to have had a successful publishing run of something you've already written. 
mm-hmm. and then your agent will broker the deal with Disney or broker the deal with you know whomever to get you to write the new novelizations of whatever. Um, this can be an amazing ability for an author to make money because these books have a guaranteed audience. They're already known to be sellers. They're going to be in every Barnes and Noble and Walmart around. And it can be a wonderful way, but you're never going to get there. I can't just send an, a query letter to Disney and tell them, I would be really awesome at writing your next Star Wars novels. Mm-hmm. Um, as much as they might look at me and go, sure, they're never going to talk to me. But an agent can easily do that for you. And then the other one is book packaging deals. Um, it's a whole thing in the industry, book packaging deals, where a publisher will decide this is the next novel they want to publish i.e. they've decided this year they're going to do a big vampire romance and then they craft it and they go out and they find somebody to write it. They may know somebody, but more than likely what happens is they have relationships with agents and stuff like that and they go, you know what? I know my client would be awesome to write your vampire romance. And then the next thing you know, you've got this huge book deal with this publishing house. Uh, Yet again, only going to come because uh, you have an agent and all of that. So it's a, it's a whole second side of the industry where there are all these books that get written, but unfortunately they're not open to just anybody. You kind of have to prove yourself and be seen and known in the industry before they're going to tap you and say, you get to write the next Star Wars novel. So it is a whole thing. I would love to get into this market, but it is, a, it is you know, it's not something you can do unless you have an agent. So. Last final thing as to what uh, agents can do for you. And on that, tune in next week for yet another interesting topic in the writing industry. Please subscribe to whichever platform that you listen to us on. And to those who have said, hey, your episodes have inspired me to continue writing or restarted my writing or that I'm more part of your writing community, thank you. Those are comments which we take to heart. Take care. See you next week. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her. Writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. In this episode, the Right Pack will continue to discussing 